Welcome, everybody. Um, my name is Richard Ross from UCLA. I'm the Education Director of the Challenge Institute for Quantum Computing that is hosting this school. I want to welcome you to our second annual Spring School on behalf of my co-organizers co from CIQC, CQSE, and IPAM at UCLA, and CQIC at the University of New Mexico. So why a school on open quantum systems? For many of us who have been working to develop qubit technologies, we're painfully aware that the couplings of our niceties quantum systems to this environment in which they live can be more than just a nuisance. We work really hard to minimize these undesired interactions, and yet they continue to haunt us. I like to remind myself that quantum computing is a fancy form of analog computing for which no perturbation is too small to care. And yet, without being too simplistic, we continue to carry around all these models of depolarizing and dephasing noise, convince ourselves we actually understand how uh, process tomography works, and we go about our business. But at the same time, our quantum information theorist friends provide us with these great working models and simulations based on some really cool sounding things, master equations, Lombladians, quantum semi-Markov processes, pointer states. But secretly, we wonder if and when we'll really need to understand any of this. Well, that time is up. As qubit systems become really that systems, we need a new language and new tools to proceed intelligently or at all. The concept for this school came about to precisely introduce these ideas old and new to this broad audience of young students and scholars heading into the field and seasoned practitioners alike. I truly hope you enjoy these sets of lectures by our esteemed faculty and take full advantage of the breakout sessions to work on problems and meet some new people in your field. Um, I want to make a few quick reminders about the schedule for this week. Um, we are starting today at 9. Tomorrow, we are starting at 8.30, and on Wednesday, we'll also be starting at 8.30 due to the time difference for uh, the lecturer, who uh, Christian Koch, who is uh, in Berlin currently. Okay, so let me introduce today's lecture. In this is the first set of lectures, Introduction to Open Quantum Systems, presented by Daniel Ladarf. Daniel is the Viterbi Professor of Engineering at USC. He serves as the director of the USC Center for Quantum Information Science and Technology, and he's also the co-director of the USC Lockheed Martin Center for Quantum Computing. Daniel has been actively engaged with multiple areas of quantum information science for most of his career, maybe all of his career, and he's made seminal contributions to many of these areas. Of note is his work on quantum computing and control and the theory of open quantum systems, as we'll hear much of today, adiabatic quantum computing and quantum annealing, where he leads the USC Lockheed Scientific Program, having used nearly every generation of D-Wave quantum processor hosted at USC. And close to my heart, the theory and construction of decoherence-free subspaces and subsystems, which turn out to be one of the key enablers for doing electron-based qubit, uh, electron qubit systems, which allow for all electrical control, among other numerous benefits. So welcome, welcome me and joining Daniel, and please enjoy the Spring School. Thank you, Richard. It's a real pleasure to be here virtually. Um, I would like to ask before I do anything else uh, that everyone please go to hellosmart.com and type in that code. Um, I see that, uh, let's see, so far uh, there is a large number of people, 36 or so, uh, who have joined. But um, there are many more people who are listed as participants. Uh, and in order to get the full benefit out of, out of today's lectures, uh, you should really see the whiteboard um, as you can only do via hellosmart.com. Otherwise, you will um, have to see it in, uh, in the video. And that is not as a high quality an experience. So please go to hellosmart.com join and that way you will have both the video feed and a, a tab where you can uh, see me writing on on the smart board in real time okay great looks like we're in the high 50s now um, everybody who hasn't joined please join okay so um my goal for today is really just to provide you with a fairly basic introduction um some of the uh the concepts that, that richard uh already noted, uh, like Lombardians and depolarizing channels and so on, uh, I plan to talk about. I'm going to start at a very basic level. Um, the goal is to get everybody uh, up to speed and 
essentially speak the same language. Uh, and then uh, the uh, other lecturers in this uh, spring school will, will take you to more advanced topics. Uh, so for those of you who have already had a, uh, a basic introduction to open quantum systems, um, this will mostly be a review. And for those of you who have never heard anything about it, um, this will probably be a, a very quick, uh, hopefully not too quick, um, introduction to the basics of, of the field. Now, I should also say that uh, the material that I plan to cover in uh, roughly three hours today, and we're getting off to a rather late start, so I think uh, we'll probably go till about, uh, well, 1230 Pacific. Um, that material is typically the subject of uh, roughly three weeks of, of lectures, um, maybe even more in an introduction to open quantum systems course I teach at USC. Uh, so this will really be kind of a, a fire hose drinking experience for, for many of you. Um, and I, I will unfortunately have to skip a lot of detail. Uh, however, uh, there are lecture notes that were posted on the uh, Spring School website. And those lecture notes contain many more details than I'm gonna have time to cover today. Uh, so by all means, I encourage you to please go ahead and consult those lecture notes if you haven't already. Uh, also, the, the problem sets that will be um, the subject of uh, uh, after the, the lectures today, uh, those are also to be found uh, embedded in these lecture notes. Um, so uh, please go ahead and check them out. Uh, and the lecture notes are actually uh, part of a textbook that uh, Umberto and I are writing. Umberto Munoz is uh, one of the uh, TAs uh, together with uh, Dr. Jenny Mosdanov. Um, they're both very proficient in, in all this material uh, and much more. Uh, so please feel free to uh, ask them in real time. And uh, uh, that is in real time during the lecture. Uh, I will not be able to answer your questions in real time, but that's what they're there for. Uh, and also they are there to uh, assist um, with the, uh, the homework uh, and the, the, uh, the problem sets um, after the lectures. Okay, so uh, without further ado, now that I hope everybody had time. Yes, there are 83 of you now. Still not everybody, but we're at about 90% or so of people who have joined Hello Smart. So if you haven't done it yet, this is your last chance. Because uh, now we're gonna switch to whiteboard and we're gonna get started. Okay, so uh, what I, I would like to start from is actually a, uh, the scenario that describes closed quantum systems, uh, and then we will rapidly progress to, to open systems. And I'll start um, from an axiomatic approach. That is, I, I want to list the four postulates of quantum mechanics, uh, or rather, a set of four postulates from which we can derive quantum mechanics as we know it. Uh, this set of postulates is, is by no means unique. And there are people working in the foundations of quantum mechanics who are very interested in um, uh, taking a different perspective. Uh, but this is a, a very good set of, uh, of four axioms or postulates uh, from which we can uh, get to work. So closed systems. Postulates for those. The first one has to do with the aware and the what quantum mechanics. And um, to be brief about it, what we can say is that quantum systems are described. by unit vectors i in Hilbert space. H. So already there's, there's a lot going on here. You have to know what a Hilbert space is. Uh, I'm not gonna 
spend a lot of time on, on defining um, basic concepts. But uh, let's just say that uh, Hilbert space, uh, for our purposes, is a vector space, typically a finite dimensional vector space with an inner product, okay? And a unit vector, of course, is a, a vector whose norm is, is one, normalized. Um, so quantum systems can be described by unit vectors. So we'll say that the norm psi, which is defined as the square root of the inner product is one. And any state like this, I can describe a, 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 um, an actual uh, quantum uh, system or any system has a state like this associated with it. And then <clears throat> the next question is, if we have two quantum systems, two or more, how do we combine them? So combining quantum systems, this is done. This is a, a crucial aspect of quantum mechanics. This is done via a tensor product, via the tensor product. So that is to say that the Hilbert space of two quantum systems, one with Hilbert space H1, another with Hilbert space H2, that Hilbert space is formed by taking the tensor product of the two Hilbert spaces. I'm not gonna define the tensor product uh, rigorously now, um, but just as by way of a, a quick example, in case you don't feel confident about it. So let's take two vectors of, of qubits, two two-dimensional Hilbert spaces. The tensor product is formed by plugging the second vector into the first one. So AC, AD, BC, ED. Right? And so uh, if the dimension of Hilbert space one is one, and likewise for two, D2, then the dimension of the new Hilbert space is D1 times D2. You see here how we got it two times two four dimensional vector. So this is the rule for combining quantum systems. And this rule gives rise to uh, important phenomena such as entanglement through the superposition principle and so on. Um, and uh, this is uh, an important difference between quantum mechanics and classical mechanics. In classical mechanics, we take the Cartesian product. In quantum mechanics, we take the tensor product. Okay, rule number three is dynamics, or postulate number three, rather, is dynamics. And dynamics, by which we mean how a system evolves in time. So this is given by the famous Schrodinger equation, right? So uh, the Schrodinger equation, this is all for closed quantum systems still. All right. It tells us that the time derivative, which I'll denote by a dot, so psi dot is given by minus i times a Hermitian operator called the Hamiltonian acting on psi. And I'm working in units where h bar equals one. Otherwise it would have been minus i h bar here. So in these units, um, energy and frequency uh, are the same in unit lines. And so here, H is the Hamiltonian, it's Hermitian. Okay, the Hamiltonian. And if you solve the Schrodinger equation, the solution, Let's assume that H is time independent. If H is time independent, then the solution for psi at time t is given by a unitary operator acting on psi at time zero, where this unitary operator, again, in the time independent case, is e to the minus i h times t. If the Hamiltonian is time dependent, the situation is a bit more complicated. Um, we're not going to be using that today, but I'll, I'll just note it. In the time dependent case, we need to introduce the so called uh, time ordered exponential. And then there's an integral here from zero to t to 
down because age is time dependent, it looks like this. Okay. All right. So those are the uh, the first three postulates. Now we get to the the fourth postulate, which is the one I actually want to spend some time on because it is the, the one that is um, least well treated typically in introductory quantum mechanics courses. And this is the, the measurement postulate. Again, I repeat that with these four postulates, you can essentially derive quantum mechanics or construct quantum mechanics as we know it. So the measurement postulate <laughs> is a statement about how we get information out of a quantum system. Um, how do we observe? So it goes like this. <clears throat> Given a set of, <clears throat> excuse me, measurement operators, and let's just call them M sub K. All right, so there's some number of them. K goes from one to let's say capital K. And that satisfy one constraint. That, that constraint is that if you sum over K, MK dagger times MK has to equal the identity operator. All right, so this any set of measures, any set of operators that satisfies this constraint is called a set of measurement operators. What happens to a state, so a normalized unit vector in the Hilbert space? It transforms instantaneously. And this, of course, is itself a big can of worms uh, because of relativity, but we're not going to go into that. Uh, we will we'll accept this transforms instantaneously as follows. So what happens to the state psi is it goes to a new state, let's call it psi k. And this new state, psi k, is given by the kth measurement operator acting on our state psi divided by the square root of pk. And what is pk? pk is the probability of this happening, right? So we have a set of capital K such operators and the statement of the measurement postulate is that with this set being measured, the state undergoes a probabilistic transformation given precisely by this rule and the probability with which we get outcome K or with which we get state psi sub K, you can think of, of K as the uh, the index of the the outcome that we get, so we actually, uh, when we make this kind of measurement, we you think of, of having a pointer of some sort, a dial, with different positions, one, two, etc., and you're going to get k with this probability pk. And what is pk? Pk. Well, this state has to be normalized, so you can see right away what pk has to be. It has to just be the norm squared of the numerator, right? Or to write it out explicitly in Brockett notation, this is psi mk dagger mk psi. And from here, you see why we need to impose this constraint that the mks add up to the identity in this way. Because if I were to sum over all indices k, well, that's one because that's all possibilities. If I move that sum inside, provided that the sum over mk dagger mk is the identity, this becomes inner product of psi with itself, which by our postulate is one. So then we have consistency. Okay, so, so this is what happens to a state. But that's not the only uh, thing that the measurement postulate tells us. It also tells us something about so-called observables. So an, an observable in 
quantum mechanics is any Hermitian operator any Hermitian operator, let's call it A. And now I, I hope that all of you are familiar with the spectral theorem um, and that you know that Hermitian operators can be diagonalized uh, in, a, uh, in an orthonormal basis and they have real eigenvalues, right? So I can write A in its spectral decomposition and let's write that as lambda I, the eigenvalues times projection operators, PI, right? So what's a projection operator? Reminder. PI is an operator that squares to identity, that squares to itself, sorry. It's Hermitian. And moreover, um, these PIs, they are mutually orthogonal meaning that PI times PJ is delta IJ PJ. These are the eigenvalues, the lambda I's, okay? Call them evals, and they are real for a Hermitian operator. They belong to the set of real numbers. Okay, so an observable is any Hermitian operator like this. Um, and what happens when we measure When we measure A, this is part of the postulate. In state psi, well, um, a complete set of projection operators satisfies this condition here. You can think of the projection operators as, as measurement operators, okay? And, and because they satisfy this constraint, or this, uh, this uh, result, um, <clears throat> actually projection operators satisfy the sum of PI equals identity. Okay, so what happens when we measure A in the state psi, we can think of the projection operators themselves as being measurement operators. So when we make this measurement, we get eigenvalue lambda I, with a probability that is given by, well, p sub i, lowercase p sub i, which is according to, according to the rule, psi projection operator psi. Again, I replaced mk dagger mk by pi because pi dagger pi is just equal to pi. Right, you see that from here. <clears throat> so when we measure an observable, what we get is its eigenvalues with probabilities dictated by, by this rule. And at the same time, the state undergoes the same kind of transformation, right? So the psi, according, this is not a new, this is not new information. This we can already see from here because the projection operators are themselves measurement operators. Psi goes to pi psi projection operator divided by this probability given above. Okay, so, so this, this is the measurement postulate. Um, the case where the MKs equal projection operators, and so when this, when this is true, this is called a projective or sometimes von Neumann measurement. So th this is the typical textbook case um, we learn about in, in introductory quantum mechanics. We only ever talk about projective measurements. But in fact, the measurement postulate is more general than that. And it allows for the so-called generalized measurements. These are generalized. And this includes, we don't have time to go into it, but this includes things like weak measurements and POVMs. Um, so there's, there's a whole interesting discussion to be had about the difference between projective measurements and, uh, and more general 
uh, types of measurements. So let's let's work out one very quick example just to to illustrate what this says in the most familiar and elementary case of, of a qubit. So let's say that we have a, a qubit. What's a qubit? A qubit is a system whose Hilbert space is just C2, right? So the, uh, the vector space of, uh, over the complex number field of dimension two with the, the standard inner product. Uh, and let's say that we make a, a uh, we prepare a state psi, a general qubit state, so A0 plus B1, right, which belongs to this Hilbert space. So what do I mean by zero and one? Zero is this unit vector, and one is this unit vector. All right, so you can also think of psi as, as a column vector, a, B. Okay, so what happens when we measure, let's pick an observable, an easy one. Let's say that we measure sigma Z. So sigma Z is the, the Pauli matrix sigma Z. I will often use just capital Z to denote it. And it's this Pauli matrix. So let's, let's say we measure this. First of all, can I legitimately call this an observable. Yes, it's an observable because it's evidently Hermitian. And, and if I were to write it in its spectral decomposition form, then you can immediately see what the eigenvalues are because they're listed on the diagonal. Right? So the first eigenvalue is one times project, projection, let's call it P0, plus the second eigenvalue, which is minus one times projection P1. And what are these projection operators? Well, in this case, they are just zero, zero outer product. P1 is one, one outer product. All right, so according to the measurement postulate, when I measure sigma z, what's going to happen is I will get lambda zero, which is the, the one here. And this is lambda one. All right, so get lambda zero equals one with a probability p zero lambda one minus one with a probability p one. And what are these probabilities? So p zero is psi projection operator p zero psi. And <clears throat> very quick calculation you can do on the side. This is just absolute value of a squared. And P1 is absolute value of B squared, right? The A and the B, the amplitudes, so A and B are called probability amplitudes or just amplitudes. So the probability of getting outcome zero corresponding to the state being projected to the zero state is given by A squared, by the amplitude squared. And P1, that's the probability of the state being projected into the one state and getting outcome negative one, that's given by, by B squared. So this is the usual Born rule of, of quantum mechanics. Born rule being that um, you get a certain outcome with a probability given by the amplitude squared of the corresponding state. Okay, so <clears throat> this was super rapid, summary of the, the four postulates of quantum mechanics for, for closed systems. Presumably, you already know all this. Um, I've seen it before or have intuited it from previous courses. So now I want to immediately transition to the same question, the four postulates for open systems. So what is an open system? Well, that's a deep question. Um, and there are many different approaches for defining exactly what we mean by this. Um, and the approach that I will take 
which um, again is not unique, but will, will suffice for our purposes, is to think of an open system as essentially the same as a closed system, but with extra uncertainty. Okay, so there's, there's nothing uncertain about the description of a closed system, except that as part of the measurement postulate, when you perform the measurement, you get an outcome with a certain probability. But in the closed system description, there's, there's a state, psi, and it undergoes some time evolution and you can measure it. Uh, but the state psi itself, its identity is, is essentially a given. In the open system case, we're going to introduce an additional classical uncertainty. So we're gonna talk about not a single state psi. We're gonna talk, oh boy. I had a feeling that uh, the whiteboard was responding slowly. So I apologize for the glitch here. Um, all right, this has never happened before. Let's, let's hope that this won't take very long. Okay, good. Back now. The only problem is. Um, okay, so I I'm not sure how to uh, zoom out of this. Oh, maybe this this is how to do it. Let's see if it work. All right, folks. Um, please take a screenshot of what what you have there. Uh, because I'm gonna I'm gonna restart this um, this whiteboard, and uh, we'll continue from here. So please take take a screenshot. I, I don't think I can save this in real time. All right, screenshot. Okay. Right. There's, there's a good chance that this got saved anyhow. Um, but just in case, let's start afresh from here. So I was talking about the four postulates for open systems. And I started to say that the difference between a closed system and an open system is uh, that we're going to have some additional uncertainty. And that, that is classical uh, lack of, of information. So what I mean by that is rather than having a single state, we're going to have a pure state ensemble. By which I, I mean that we have a collection of states, call them psi i, each with probability qi. So the qi's are probabilities. All right, probabilities. So this is to say that an open system is a lot like a closed system, except that instead of having a single state, there's now an ensemble, a probabilistic ensemble of states. And now we want to rely on the postulates that we already stipulated for closed systems in order to reconstruct the postulates for this type of, of scenario. We, we're not gonna need new postulates. We're just going to repurpose the closed system postulates for this scenario. So, um, so suppose that we, we make a measurement in this setting. Measure our measurement operators, MK. What, what happens? So let's say that we pick a particular state, psi i. Right. Well, according to the, the measurement postulate, 
we know what's going to happen in principle. Psi i is going to transform into a new state. Let's call it psi i k, like this, which is given by, well, mk acting on the state psi i, divided by the square root of a probability. This is now a conditional probability. This is a probability where the outcome k is obtained given that we started from state psi i, right? Because we, we assume that we're starting in, in that particular state psi i. And what is this conditional probability, pk given i? Well, it is just the usual thing, the norm of the numerator squared, right? Or in other words, psi i, mk dagger, mk, Okay. Daniel, one quick yes. thing. So when you refresh the whiteboard, people yes. it looks like people need to log out and log back into Hello Smart to see the current whiteboard. So All hopefully right. everyone heard that. Uh, let me stop sharing and give everybody a chance to go back to to this address. Um, the code is listed at the very top of the chat. As, by the way, I forgot to say is the, um, the list of topics I plan to cover today, in case you're curious. Go to the very top of the chat. All right, so let's start sharing again. And Richard, can you tell me if this is working now? Yes, yeah, it's working and it sounds like people have it working for themselves. Okay, okay, good. Thank you. All right. So, okay. So, this is for a given state psi i. But what I would really like to know is what's the probability of outcome k again, right? So, what is the probability piece of k? Uh oh, it's doing this weird thing again with the delay. I hope we're not going to get kicked out again. Oh no, this is a bad sign. Huh. Never had a, uh, a session with uh, so many people logged on at the same time. There, there might be some kind of a bandwidth issue here. So sorry, folks, we'll, we'll power through this. All right, so what's the probability of, of outcome K? Well, it depends on which state we started from. All right, so we started with state. Oh boy. This is a problem. Wow. Sorry guys, unexpected glitches here. Uh, okay, here's what I'm gonna do. I, I'm going to turn this off, do a total reset, and hopefully um, we'll be good. I'm going to do a, a hard reset. I'm going to unplug this from power because I, I don't trust this soft reset. So you're definitely going to get kicked out now. Yeah, I'll also comment. Some, some people just put in the chat that some people can see the whiteboard on the Zoom video alone. Uh -huh. So maybe what people can do is those that can see it well, not sign on to uh, smart thing to Hello Smart and those uh, that need to really see it on Hello Smart to do so. And we'll see if that works better. All right, this, this will just take a minute. Um, it will ask me to sign in again. <laughs> that will take a, a bit more than a minute.
Okay. Um, do we need to uh, do the sharing, Richard? Or can you see this? Uh, when I refresh the one I had open, I see the old screen. You see the old screen. All right, so let's start sharing. Uh, no, no, actually it just refreshed, sorry. It took a second. Okay. All right. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, okay. I see that. Yep, looks good. Fingers crossed. All right, go ahead. Okay. <laughs> All right. So, where were we? We said <clears throat> that we uh, start from some states I I. And this state has probability, a priori probability, QI. That's our the probability it has in the pure state ensemble. And then we measure our measurement operators. So psi i goes to a new state, psi i k, given by mk psi i, divided by the conditional probability of k given i, right? And this k, pk given i is psi i. MK dagger, MK psi i. But now we want to know what is the probability of outcome K? And because we don't know the initial state, we just know it happened with probability QI. Right? So the, the actual probability of outcome K is given by P K given I times the a priori probability QI. Right? And if and if we plug in the expression for pki, then this is mk dagger mk psi i. And now I want to remind you of a little identity, which is useful. And it, it says this, that for any, 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 any state psi, any operator a, this matrix element, you can rewrite it as the trace of A times the outer product of psi with itself. Okay, this is a, a little side exercise you can, you can prove for yourself. So with this in mind, I can write K as QI. And now here I have exactly this scenario, right? The operator A is MK dagger MK. So I can write this as the trace of MK dagger MK times the outer product of psi i itself. And because trace is linear, you can take it out of the sum. All right, so you can write this as sum over i of um, <clears throat> Uh, well, let's let's write it as a trace of the sum over i of q i um, of psi i times psi i m k Trace of MK dagger MK times this. Okay, so I interchange the, the, the trace and, and the summation. And this object here is very important. This is the density matrix, rho. So you see that uh, by, by asking this question of what is the probability of a certain measurement outcome starting from a, a pure state ensemble, we're led to a new operator, which I'm calling rho. Okay, so I'll try this as the trace of mk dagger mk times rho. 
And this, this new operator, the density matrix, plays an absolutely crucial role in the whole theory of, of open quantum systems. The density matrix, or density operator, it's an operator, summarizes the same information that we already had in the pure state ensemble. The pure state ensemble was a, a collection of states. Right? So this is equivalent to the pure state ensemble we had, which was a collection of states with some a priori probabilities. Rather than writing a list like this, which of course is very cumbersome uh, for calculational purposes, instead of writing this list, we can write this operator, uh, which combines the probabilities and the states in, into, into one object. And this operator, the density matrix, is equivalent. It contains the same information as the, the list, as the pure state ensemble, but it's much more convenient to work with, and it will turn out to, to replace the notion of a, a single state or a so-called pure state. And we'll, we'll define what we mean by, by purity in, uh, in just a moment. So the density matrix is, is absolutely crucial. Um, and it has some properties that we're going to, uh, to investigate. But uh, for one, I want to immediately point out uh, two properties. Right, so you can right away see that rho is Hermitian. And if you take the Hermitian conjugate, then that just interchanges the cat and the bra and nothing changes. And the QI, these are probabilities. So they're, they're real, they're positive. So they don't change under Hermitian conjugation. So it's Hermitian. And also the trace of rho, well, let's calculate that, right? So the trace of rho, is QI times the trace of psi I with psi I. And this, by the same rule that I used here, if, if I make A the identity operator, right, then this is just the inner product of psi I with itself, but psi I is a normalized state. So this is one. So this is the sum of the QI, which is one. These are probabilities. So the trace of a density matrix is one, right? And, and that, that comes about because of the normalization of, uh, of each state in, in the pure state ensemble. Um, actually, it's not just that rho is, is Hermitian. Rho is also a, a positive operator. So what's a, a positive operator is, is simply an operator whose eigenvalues are positive. Uh, more precisely, it's a positive semi-definite operator, meaning all of its eigenvalues are non-negative. Some could be zero, but I'll, I'll just, I'll, I'll usually say positive uh, instead of positive semi-definite. Um, so we can replace this by, um, actually, yeah. So positivity will, will imply permitticity. Actually, rho is a positive operator positive semi-definite, we'll write it like this. So uh, this notation means that the operator has positive or zero eigenvalues. And, and, and why is that? Well, it's enough to check that for any vector V, this is positive or non-negative for any vector V, because in particular, if V is an eigenvector of rho, then this has to be true in order for the eigenvalues to be non-negative, right? And, and why, why is that true? Well, that's true because if, if we actually take such an inner uh, product or such a matrix element, sorry, uh, for rho, then this says V rho, we said is something like this, I, I with V. And if I move this V inside here, Right, then you see that this is just the sum over i, q, i, absolute value squared of v psi i. So of course, this is a positive quantity and q, the q i's are positive, right? And so therefore, this whole thing is positive. Okay, so rho, rho is a positive operator. All right, 
So we've we've introduced the density matrix. Right away, we see that it satisfies these two important conditions. Uh, it's traces one, it's positive. And what what does it tell us? Well, for one thing, it tells us the rule for how, how to calculate probabilities of measurements. Uh, so the probability of outcome number k is given by this nice rule, trace mk dagger mk times rho. You need to know rho in order to calculate the probability of, of the kth outcome. But we can also ask what happens to the system after we've made this measurement. In other words, now that we know that it's described equivalently by a density matrix, um, <clears throat> this is prior to the measurement, right? Because here we, we have all the original information, all the states I and all the probabilities QI. So this row describes the system prior to the measurement. What happens to the system after the measurement? So we want to know how row transforms. Rho goes into some new state, rho sub k, which is associated with the kth outcome. Right? So with probability pk, the system will transform into this new state rho k. And what, what is this new state? Well, now we know that we got the outcome k. So now we're going to sum over i. And now, because we were given that the outcome was k, we're starting from k. So now i is conditional on k. This is another conditional probability. Notice that it's, it's different from the one I had here, right? Here it was k given i. Now it's i given k because we are fixing the index k. Outcome k has happened times, well, this is a density matrix. So this is the a priori probability of state psi i k. The reason I'm writing it like this is because this is exactly in the form of, of the appropriate density matrix. Right? It's the a priori probability times the outer product of the corresponding state with itself. And if we plug in what we know here, so this is sum over i, this conditional probability, psi i k is, is given by this rule. So it's n k. divided by p k given i squared, the square root squared, so p k given i. You see that we, we have a ratio of conditional probabilities here. And, and this ratio we can figure out by Bayes rule. Right, so Bayes rule tells us that the probability of the joint event i and k that is given by the probability of, let's say, k given i times the a priori probability of i, or equivalently, it's given by probability of i and k times the a priori probability of k. And in our notation, probability of i is that's what we call qi. That's the probability i state, and uh, probability k is what I computed earlier. That's that pk over there. So therefore, this ratio, pi given k divided by pk given i, well, what is it? So i given k, that is what um, uh, pk. Uh, P, QI, sorry, divided by PK, like so. Right? And so, rho K, the state that we got after the measurement, is the sum over I of QI, MK, psi I, K dagger, divided by PK, which I can rearrange slightly, I can write this, you can take the mk outside, do a sum over i here, qi psi i, psi, mk dagger, all this divided by pk, 
and lo and behold, this is rho again. So rho k, what is the state post measurement? We figured it out. Now we know that it's mk rho mk dagger divided by pk. This is, this is the rule for how a density matrix transforms after a measurement, right? And the probability of that outcome, pk, is the one that we already derived, right? So it's the trace of, and I can cycle the mk dagger under the trace. I can write it as mk rho mk dagger. So now we, we have finished reformulating postulate number four, in case you didn't notice. All right, postulate four was the measurement postulate. The measurement postulate told us how states transform. Well, that was the first part. And the second part was about what happens when you measure an observable. So now we know that if you start from a system that has uncertainty in it, a pure state ensemble, all right, so that the pure state ensemble we started from was with probability QI, yes, state psi i. This is what I'm, I'm calling an open quantum system. An open quantum system is one where you have some probability associated with every one of the individual unit vectors or, or states. You construct a density matrix according to this rule. And if you make a set of measurements, if you make a measurement using a set of measurement operators, then the rule is that that density matrix rho transforms into a new state rho k given by this expression, which you should contrast with how in the closed system case, what happened, right? So there psi went to psi k. It kind of looks like a square root of the uh, transformation for density matrix. Right. Rho goes into this. Psi goes into this. So, of course, the state has an operator acting on it just from the left. An operator has, an, uh, uh, like the density matrix, has the measurement operators acting on it from the left and from the right. Uh, and the probability, instead of being the square root here, it's the actual probability in the denominator. So, so this is, setting this aside, right? This is postulate number four, first part of it for open systems. That's how density matrices transform. And the rule for what happens when you measure an observable, that doesn't change uh, in, any, in any significant way. I'll just say that when you measure an observable, right, let's again write it as lambda k pk, where the lambdas are the eigenvalues of the observable, pk are uh, orthonormal, mutually orth or, uh, orthogonal projections, then now we just get outcome, we get the eigenvalue lambda k with a probability pk, which is given by this rule, except that instead of generalized measurements, we can use the projectors, so it just becomes trace of rho times pk. Okay, so that, that's the only change as far as observables are concerned. In fact, no change at all. Um, because this is the, the same rule uh, that we had before written in terms of the trace formula. Okay, so we've, we've successfully generalized postulate four. What about the other three postulates for open systems? Postulate number one, in fact, I already stated. Postulate one. Postulate one is essentially the statement that I sort of informally made over there that a quantum system Described uh, 
by a pure state ensemble QI psi i. But now we also know, or equivalently, that we can also describe it by a density matrix rho, which is QI. So, uh, and these, these states, the psi i, they live in a Hilbert space. Rho is an operator, but rho is a, a transformation of the Hilbert space to itself because it's an operator. And we can get fancy about this. We can ask what state, what space does rho itself live in? Well, so let's call that space B of H. And this, this space is the space of linear operators, linear bounded operators. That's what this notation means. The space of linear bounded operators acting on, on the Hilbert space H. And in fact, we know more, right? We know that rho has two defining properties, trace rho one and rho is positive semi-definite. So, so postulate one says that a quantum system, an open quantum system is described by a pure state ensemble or equivalent a density matrix um, with all this other baggage about the Hilbert space and the space of operators uh, on the Hilbert space. Okay, so, so we got postulates one and four. I'm seeing ominous signs that my cursor is dragging again. So I hope I'm gonna have another crash soon, but could happen. Um, so let's go to postulate number two now. Yeah, not good. Uh, I'm gonna ask, uh, man. I'm sorry, folks. This is really unfortunate. Um, let's, uh, let's experiment um, with people who don't absolutely need the sharing to uh, to log off. Um, if you're if you're good with seeing the whiteboard as it is, please log off. And let's see if the issue here is bandwidth. I suspect it is because I've I've never had this problem before. Uh, thank you. I see the numbers dropping there. And again, my apologies for that glitch. Uh, so down to to high 80s. Uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna wait until this this drops down to about um, thirty or so. So more more people, please sign off for now, because uh, I I know from classroom experience that thirty is has never been a problem. Okay, um, while while we wait for that, uh, more people, please drop off. Uh, if anybody has a question, um, this this is a good time. Uh, you can uh, unmute yourself, and hopefully, you can do that. Yeah, Richard, is that option enabled for participants? Can they participate by audio? I'm not sure if Richard is still there. Only right, somebody says. Okay. All right. So it, well, if anyone wants to participate and say something, uh, try to raise your hand and I'll unmute you. I will take this opportunity for. Okay. We are also getting some QA questions. Okay. Go for it. Okay. Um, Okay, here, here's one. Here's one that maybe. Uh, here's one in the Q and A. Is there any other formalism, other than the density matrix, to describe open quantum systems? Asked by Muhammad Faryad. Um, well, I mean, as um, as I stated at the outset, you can you can work with these ensembles. Uh, you don't. 
necessarily have to work with the density matrix. Uh, so you can resort to the ensemble language instead. Uh, you can always work with a description involving unit vectors, the psi i's, and keep track of the probability separate. So that would be an equivalent formalism. There's nothing wrong with it, except that it's um, a lot less convenient than the density matrix. Any, any other questions? We still have 70 people signed on, so I'm still a little concerned here. So if you'd like, um, so Kian is asking a question, maybe we can elaborate this a little more. Why okay. is the density matrix formalism more powerful than the original uh, formalism? Yeah. So the first part is that it, it's not just that it's more powerful. This is perhaps a, a more an issue of emphasis. It's essential for us in order to be able to describe real world uh, scenarios, that is open systems, uh, to work not with um, the original formalism of, of, of closed systems, where you just have a single state. Uh, the uncertainty that comes about uh, these QIs that I've, I've introduced here, this is certain uncertainty turns out to be an essential part of the description of, of a realistic uh, system. Uh, um, so you know, think of a system as a quantum computer uh, coupled to its environment. And we're gonna talk about that uh, setting uh, very soon. There are things you don't know about the environment. That's why we call it the environment. Um, you have your quantum computer. Suppose you knew everything there was to know about how you constructed it, about its interior components and so on. Well, it still exists in the, in the wider universe. Um, and you will never know everything there is to know about the wider universe. Uh, so that's where that uncertainty comes from. There's always something else going on, except if what you're trying to describe is the universe as a whole. Right? So if, uh, if you wanted to apply quantum mechanics to the universe as a whole, um, then you could go back to the original setting of a closed system. And indeed, the universe as a whole would, by definition, be a closed system. There's nothing outside of the universe, by definition. Right? And so um, to the extent that uh, quantum mechanics a la non-relativistic quantum mechanics a la Schrodinger is correct, uh, we would need nothing else to describe the whole universe. But as soon as we focus in on a subset of the universe, the subsystem, uh, then you got your system, you got the rest. The rest means there's uncertainty. So these QIs necessarily arise. Um, and, 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 and then we introduce the density matrix as a more convenient formalism to deal with. Okay. Um, <laughs> we're, we're stuck at 71 or so people who are, who are still logged in. Uh, so hopefully things will be a bit more stable now. All right, so I talked about postulates one and four for open systems. Now let's go, good, okay. Let's go to postulate two. And I can get this resolution go back to normal. Okay, all right, we can work with this. Um, so postulate two was about the tensor product, right? and, and the tensor product is unchanged. I have, I have nothing new to say about it. It's still the tensor product, done. Three, dynamics. So this one is, is fairly straightforward to generalize. Uh, we already know from the closed system case, we know that psi of t is given by the unitary acting on psi of zero. Right? And we said that the unitary is e to the minus i the Hamiltonian times t in, in the time independent case. Well, now we just have an ensemble of these and, and, uh, um, and the density matrix will be QI. Each one of these states is 
evolving in time. And so the QIs are the a priori initial probabilities. They are what is what is given to us. So in other words, the, the original pure state ensemble has these probabilities QI and the initial states psi i at zero from a time dependent perspective. We're given some initial probabilities and some initial states psi i at zero. And now we, these states all evolve in time. Each one evolves according to the same Schrodinger equation because it's the same system, right? It's just different states of the same system. They're all governed by the same Hamiltonian. Uh, and we know what this is. This is ui, the unitary, acting on psi i of zero. Dagger g. Okay, and if I move a qi over there, you see that this is just u of g acting on rho at time zero, u dagger t. Okay, so this is the, the time evolution rule for density matrices. Whereas for ordinary states, we had psi of t is u of t times psi of zero. Now we have u acting from both the left and the right with, of course, the dagger on the right. And likewise, we can write down the Schrodinger equation. Actually, it's not called the Schrodinger equation in this case. It's called the Liouville von Neumann equation. So if you differentiate rho dot, it's a simple exercise to show that you will get minus i times the commutator of the Hamiltonian with rho. Okay, and the commutator between any two operators A and B is defined as AB minus BK. Okay, so this is the rho dot equals minus I commutator H of rho is the replacement of the Schrodinger equation. Again, this is called the Liouville von Neumann equation. And rho of t is u rho zero u dagger is the replacement of the time evolution, the integrated time evolution. And that's it, there we have it. Those are the, the four postulates of quantum mechanics, now generalized to density matrices or to open systems. Okay, so this is a good time for another question from the q and if, if anybody has a question, because we're, we're done with the postulates. Okay, uh, so I see uh, Daniel Tan as his hand up. Would you like to uh, speak your question? Yeah, can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah, uh, I'm still uh, confused about like the first line uh, where we derive rho k. So okay. is this the spec, so is I the spectral decomposition or is it like the sort of index of the states in the in ensemble? All right, so you're asking about this. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so here what, what I'm saying, is this is not the spectral decomposition. This is the, this is the pure state ensemble, this line here, okay? This is the pure state ensemble that's associated with the, with the uh, outcome K having been observed. If outcome K ha has been observed, well, that each of the pure states, psi i, ended up in psi i k, if the outcome K was observed. And that happens with an a priori probability fixed with fixed K, because we said the outcome K has been observed. So now it's P of I given outcome K. So think of this as the pure state ensemble P I K psi I K. Okay, it's it's this this is the pure state ensemble that uh, is being described here. Okay, thanks. Okay. Any more?
navigate so the... yes let's see uh, maybe let's clarify this uh, so Bilal Khalid asks why can't the QIs be time dependent oh um, so by construction where the the QIs in this formalism um, are the initial the a priori initial probabilities of of each of the states. Okay, so we we're assuming, oops, we're assuming that we're starting from we're starting from a pure state ensemble. I could have called this QI zero, but let me not do that. Our pure state ensemble has some states psi i at time zero that have initial probabilities QI. Okay, so those are the, the initial probabilities with which the states are prescribed. These probabilities are just the initial time probabilities. The states are what evolves. That's what we have the rule for, the time evolution rule. We know how these states evolve, right? According to the third postulate for, for closed systems. So each state will undergo an evolution by the Schrodinger equation or, or by, this, by this unitary transformation. The QIs are simply their initial probabilities. That's why they don't evolve in time. Okay, so let's let's move on and, and keep keep asking good questions. Um, let's go down here. Um, keep putting your questions in the in the Q and A if you'd like, and uh, Umberto and Genia can can address them in, in real time. So now that we are done with with our postulates, um, I have uh, used the word pure. Uh, a bunch of times and when talking about the, the pure state ensemble. Uh, and that word has a technical meaning. Let me try this one more time here. Okay. So uh, I want to define a very important number known as the purity. Right? So purity is uh, a single number that is going to tell us something about the state we're dealing with. And it's defined, purity is defined as the trace of rho squared, okay? So suppose we have rho is a, a pure state ensemble of one. A pure state ensemble of one means with probability one, I get state psi. There's only one state, so it has to be there with, with probability one. This is what describes always describes a closed system. Always. But not only a closed system. You could have you could still have an open system uh, where for some reason um, all your uncertainty has has disappeared, and you you know that you have that one state psi with probability one. Okay, so this is a particular type of state, and let's calculate its purity. In this case, purity is the trace of psi squared. So let me write it again. Of course, this in the middle here, this is one. So this is just the trace of psi times psi, which again is psi times psi like this, which is one. So for a pure state ensemble, of a single state, the purity is one. Okay, and that's why this is called a pure state. For a pure state ensemble of many states, or more than one to be precise, okay, let's say that uh, UI. Uh, yeah, some QI are not zero, right? So there's more than one term in the sum. In this case, let's look at the purity. So now the purity is the trace of, I have to square this operator. When I do that, I get a double sum. Right? Sum over I, sum over J, QI, QJ, I, 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 I. 
times J J. Unfortunate way of writing it. J, right, and this is a number, right? This is this is a scalar. So this is equal to the trace of sum over i and j q i q j. And let me move the trace inside. This psi i psi j, the one from the middle there, times the trace of psi i psi j. That comes from this one and this one, right, with the trace acting on them. And this, of course, is once more psi j i. So you see that we ended up with sum over i and j, q i q j, times the absolute value squared of psi i psi j. And now we can use the Cauchy-Schwartz inequality. We know by, by the Cauchy-Schwartz inequality that this is less than or equal to the norm squared of psi i times the norm squared of psi j. That just basic Cauchy Schwartz, but this is one, and this is one. Right? And, and then what we're left with is just this product of two sums. This is equal to the sum of the QI times the sum of the QJ, each of which is one. So you see that if you have a genuine ensemble with, with more than uh, one state in, in the sum here. Um, what we've just shown is that the purity is less than or equal to one. Okay. And this case is not called a pure state. This is called a mixed state. So the purity is a way of quantifying whether our system is effectively closed, well, it's a bad way to put it. It's the purity, when the purity is one, it's a way of saying that the pure state ensemble just has one element. In other words, we can describe it as a single state vector. Whereas if we have a mixed state, we have no, no choice essentially, but to describe it in terms of an actual ensemble or in terms of a, a density matrix with uh, which is not a, a rank one operator, right? This is a, a rank one operator. So the purity is, is a number that is um, strictly between zero and one. Actually, the lower bound is, is not zero. The lower bound can be made tighter, but let's not get into that. Uh, the, the purity is bounded between one and zero. One on the one on the extreme end are the pure states. And when the purity is less than one, we have what we call mixed states. Okay, so with that in mind, with the purity defined, I now want to apply uh, these general abstract concepts to the case of a qubit. And I, I want to talk about how we visualize uh, a qubit using so-called blocks here. And, um, and of course, the, the case that I'm interested in is the case of a qubit described by a density matrix. All right. So, so what's, what's a qubit thought of as a density matrix? The density matrix of a qubit. The qubit, again, is a system that lives in a two-dimensional Hilbert space, C2. Right? And so as a matrix, it would have to be a two by two matrix. The most general density matrix that I could write down for a qubit without any constraints yet is some general two by two matrix. But immediately I can simplify this because I know that trace of rho is one. So that tells me that actually D is just one minus A. 
So the more general way, a more specific way of writing the density matrix of a qubit is like this. But I also know that it's Hermitian, right? It's, as we uh, showed when we defined the density matrix. So actually, I don't need the number C here. I can write it as B complex conjugate. This is because rho is Hermitian. OK, can we do any better than that? The answer is yes. So the next thing we, we can do is we, we can use the fact that rho is, is positive. Okay. And um, in order to, to exploit this, we need to calculate rho's eigenvalues. Right? This is telling us that the eigenvalues of rho are, are positive. And how do you calculate the eigenvalues? Well, it's, you know, uh, you can do that by uh, calculating the determinant of lambda i identity minus rho um, and solving this uh, for the roots of this equal to zero. Right? So that's the characteristic equation. Uh, so what is the determinant here for a two by two matrix? Uh, you might remember this is just lambda squared minus the trace of rho times lambda uh, plus the determinant of rho. That's the characteristic uh, polynomial of the um, of a two by two matrix. The trace of rho, this is one. Okay. So the solution of this equation, lambda plus minus, those are the two eigenvalues that need to be positive. Those uh, two eigenvalues are one half of uh, one plus or minus the square root of one uh, minus four times the determinant of rho. Okay, so we need to calculate the determinant of rho, uh, which of course we can do, but instead of using this AB type parameterization, um, let's do something else. And that's gonna lead us to the, the box here. So let's introduce a, a convenient parameterization of our density matrix. I'm gonna use the poly matrices, sigma x, which I'll often write as x, sigma y, sigma z. Right? And so this is 0, 1, 1, 0. This is 0 minus i, i, 0. This is 1, 0, 0, minus 1. Now let's add to that the identity matrix, which is sometimes convenient to write as sigma zero. Okay. Um, and if, if you think about it, these four matrices, the three poly matrices and the, um, and the identity matrix, they form a basis for all Hermitian matrices, two by two matrices, all Hermitian two by two matrices. They're each Hermitian. By the way, notice that they are, so sigma alpha, Dagger is sigma alpha, they're Hermitian, and they are also traceless. Sigma trace of sigma alpha is zero, with the exception of the identity matrix, of course, whose trace is two. All right, so with that in mind, I can write rho as a linear combination of the three poly matrices and the identity matrix. And in, in particular, I can write it always in this form. One half the identity matrix plus Vx poly matrix X, Vy poly matrix Y, Vz poly matrix Z, where Vx, Vy, and Vz, these are gonna be the components of a vector V. known as the block vector. And it belongs to R3, it's a real vector. Um, this is Hermitian because X, Y, and Z are Hermitian. And because I made the VX's, VY, VZ is real. 
So it's, that's why it's Hermitian. It has trace one, because if I take the trace, the identity trace is two divided by two is one, and the trace of X, Y, and Z is zero. So this is, this is a proper way to write the density matrix. Right? There are three real numbers here, Z, X, V, Y, and Z, Z. Just like there are three real numbers here, because A is real and B is complex. Right? So two, comp two real numbers for B plus A, that's three real numbers. So this is just another way of, of writing the density matrix. Um, let's write it as row is one half identity plus sum over i, i goes from one to three, the i sigma or alpha, whatever, sigma i. Like so, so when, when, I, when I write i goes from one to three, I mean the same as i goes over x, y, and z. Sometimes this is a convenient way to do it. Um, and in terms of a matrix, a two by two matrix, you see that when you add all the, the poly matrices here, here they are. So it's easy to, to just perform this addition and get, get a matrix out of it. So what do we get? One half, the identity matrix puts a one and a one here. The sigma Z puts a plus VZ and a minus VZ here. The sigma X puts a VX here and a VX here. And then minus IVY plus Okay, and that we can now identify with, with our A and B, if you'd like. Um, now let's calculate the determinant, which we needed for the eigenvalues. So what's the determinant? So it's one quarter, right? One plus VZ times one minus VZ. So that's one minus VZ squared, minus the product of the off diagonals. So that's minus VX squared minus Vy squared, which is just one quarter of one minus the norm of the vector V squared. Okay, so you see how the determinant is conveniently expressed of the norm of, of the block vector. And what we needed was for the eigenvalues to be positive. So if I go back to the eigenvalues, which I want to be positive, these eigenvalues, given by one half, one plus minus square root of now what? One minus four times the determinant. So one minus one minus norm of B squared. Okay, so that is one half plus minus length of the vector V. And because this has to be positive, we can conclude that the norm of the vector V, well, if I subtract, I can make a negative, but not if the norm of V is less than or equal to one. All right, so, so we've now deduced from the positivity condition of the density matrix that the Bloch vector has to be norm less than or equal to, to one. And that gives us the Bloch sphere. The Bloch sphere is simply in the plane in the space with axes Vx, Vy, and Vz, the Bloch sphere is a unit sphere. So this is radius one. And now we know that every, every qubit density matrix can be described instead of using the density matrix. I guess this is a partial answer to the question from before. Is there another way to think about, um, about states of open systems? So for the case of a qubit, you can equivalently Instead of the density matrix, you can use the, the Bloch vector or the Bloch sphere. Um, every state of a qubit is described by 
some vector v whose norm is at most one. So there are states that live on the surface of the sphere and in a moment we'll characterize them. And there are states that live inside the sphere uh, whose norm is less than one. Every point in or on the surface of the sphere corresponds to the state of a qubit. Okay. So the Bloch sphere is, is a very nice geometric way to visualize what, um, what qubit states look like geometrically, so to speak. Uh, but we can take this a step further and we can use the notion of purity, right? Because we, we talked about how purity is one. Those are, the, those are the pure states described by a single state in the pure state ensemble, purity less than one, more than one state in the pure state ensemble. So what, what does that mean in terms of uh, the Bloch sphere? Well, let's calculate the purity. Um, so the purity, trace of rho squared is now the trace of, okay, it's a little bit of work. All right, so rho is, is given by, by this expression. Okay, so that's the, the square of, of this expression. I can pull out one fourth. Uh, and if I square this expression, I have the identity squared, which is identity. Then I have the double sum over i and j, right? v i, v j, sigma i, sigma j. And then I have um, twice this, so plus two times v i sigma i. All right, but I'm taking the trace. So upon taking the trace, the identity just gives us two. The last term is traceless because here we're summing over the three poly matrices, each of which is traceless. So this last term gives a zero trace. And this term, there's an identity for poly matrices uh, that is, is handy here. So the identity for poly matrices, which I'm sure you've seen is that uh, this is given by uh, epsilon i j k i times epsilon i j k sigma k right, the Levi Shivata tensor plus delta i j identity. If i is equal to j, then the poly matrices they square to identity, so that's why we get this extra term. And, and if I take the trace. Then again, this term, because it's the trace of a poly matrix, this term goes away after I take the trace. So what's left is just the term with, with identity and the trace of identity is two. All right, so plus two, and now I have the delta ij, which makes the indices i and j equal. So that becomes the sum over i of the i squared. Right, and what is that? Well, that's one half, one plus the norm squared of the Bloch vector again. Okay, but I know that the norm of the Bloch vector is at most one. So therefore, this is, if I plug in one, two divided by two, that's one. All right, so this is also upper bounded by one. Um, and um, you know, if, if the norm of the Bloch vector is, is zero, I said earlier that the purity, when I, I wrote purity is between one and zero, I said the lower bound wasn't, wasn't tight. Now you see why, because if the purity, if, if the Bloch vector norm is zero, that's as small as it can go, right, then the purity is actually a half, it's not zero. Right? So, so in fact, for a qubit, we can make the lower bound tighter. Now, what are the states that have maximal purity, the, the pure states? So pure states, P equals one, right? That corresponds to Bloch vector having norm one. And purity less than one, that corresponds to Bloch vectors with norm strictly less than one. 
So this picture we have of, of the Bloch sphere is, is actually more interesting. Pure states are precisely those states that live on the surface of the Bloch sphere because they have a Bloch vector of whose norm is one. And mixed states are the ones that live inside the Bloch sphere. Right? So that's, that's the general geometric picture of uh, qubit density matrices. Pure states on the surface, mixed states in the interior of the Bloch sphere. And then finally, uh, and then we'll take a break. Uh, let's talk about some specific states. So we'll get even more of a feel for the, the qubit Bloch sphere. So let's talk about, uh, first of all, the case where the Bloch vector is the zero vector. Uh, so of course, this is only possible if V itself is the zero vector. So the state that lives at the origin. Right, so what is the state that lives at the origin? Well, by the, the formula, rho is one half identity plus the i sigma i. Right? If uh, the Bloch vector components are all zero, this becomes one half identity. And this is this state is called the maximally mixed state. And if you write it out as a density matrix, so well, let's, let's write it out like this: one half, one half, zero, zero. This is equivalent to a pure state ensemble. Right, what is the corresponding pure state ensemble? Well. With probability half, you get the state zero. With probability half, you get the state one. This is just a classical coin, an unbiased classical coin. With probability half, it's heads, probability half, it's tails. All right, so th this is just like a classical unbiased coin. So this is a, a purely classical state, as boring as it gets the maximally mixed state. That's the state that lives at the origin. Okay, that's the origin. What about states for which um, the block vector, let's take zero, zero, one. So this is the state at the North Pole. Okay, so what, what does that correspond to? State at the North Pole. Well, in that case, rho is one half identity plus the only component is sigma z, right, which is the density matrix that looks like this, one plus one here. So two divided by two, that's one. One minus one down here, zero, everything else zero. Right, this is the state that is the outer product of the one zero vector with itself. Or in other words, it's the state zero, the pure state zero. So the state that lives at the North Pole is the pure state zero. And the state that lives at the South Pole, I'll let you check is one. Right, so that would be B equals zero, zero, negative one. That corresponds to rho is one outer product with itself. Uh, what about V is one, zero, zero. So the state that is on the x-axis, positive x-axis, but pure because right? it, it has length one. So we know it has to be pure. So in this case, rho is one half identity plus sigma x, which is one, 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 divided by two. Right? And you can easily see that this is just one over root two 
times one one outer product with one one over root two. And that's known as the plus state. Plus is zero plus one over root two. So this state over here is the plus state. It's the plus one eigenvalue eigenvector of sigma x. x times the plus state is the plus state. So this is the plus one eigenvalue eigenvector of the sigma x operator. And likewise, if you pick minus one, zero, zero, you'll find that rho is just a minus state. Where the minus state has a minus here. These are sometimes called cat states as well. Right? So equal superpositions of, uh, of, of zero and one with opposite signs, um, either plus or minus. So this is the minus state, the one that lives on the x-axis on the other side. And finally, if you pick sigma y instead, plus or minus one here, then you get rho is, again, it's a simple calculation of the same type. You get plus or minus i, where plus or minus i, these are the eigenstates of the sigma y operator. So with plus or minus, or more explicitly, plus or minus i is zero plus or minus i times one over root two. So those are the states that, that live here and here. Minus i. That's the uh, the picture of, of the block sphere of a qubit. Maximally mixed state, classical coin state, lives at the origin. The six polar states, uh, the north pole is zero, south pole is one. Then we got the plus and the minus on the x-axis, the plus i minus i on the y-axis. And of course, uh, an infinite number of other states uh, everywhere else, uh, pure states on the surface and mixed states in the interior. Okay, so I think with that, um, it's time to take a break. We've been going for about an hour and 40 minutes by my calculation, um, minus interruptions. Uh, so maybe before we, uh, we take a, Let's say a ten-minute break. Uh, are there are there any um, questions, urgent questions in the audience? Let's see. So, everyone, post questions now. Uh, Let's see, so we do have one question. Are there some pages in Sakurai or Griffith that goes over this? Um, I think the answer is yes, though I couldn't say which pages specifically regarding the block vector, I, uh, I believe. There are many pages in the lecture notes that go over this in more detail and more slowly. And so I encourage you to consult the lecture notes. And certainly this is standard material and uh, you can find it in uh, various textbooks as well. Okay, so let's take a 15 minute break. Um, local time here is 11.04. So why don't we resume at 11.20 Pacific? I'll see you then.
Ah, there we go. All right, welcome back everyone to the uh, second part of today's uh, spring school session. So in the first part, we talked about the postulates, um, the four postulates of quantum mechanics. First, briefly, uh, as they pertain to closed systems, then we generalized them to the open systems. Um, and then um, we talked about uh, uh, what a, a qubit looks like uh, visualized on, on a box sphere. Uh, and now what, what I'd like to do is to go uh, a, a big step uh, forward towards what we really are interested in in the context of uh, open quantum systems. And I'd like to um, introduce the idea uh, of a, a system that is coupled to an environment or to a bath, which we already brought up uh, briefly as a uh, uh, response to one of the questions I would ask. So the, the general scenario that we have in mind in, in the open system setting is of some system of interest. Again, think of it as your quantum computer, if you'd like, coupled to the rest of the universe, which we, we call the environment or the bath. But we're really only interested in describing the system. And we're not interested in describing the state of the rest of the universe or the environment. Right? So we need, we need to find a way, uh, a tool, a technical tool, that is going to allow us to focus just on the system of interest. And uh, because we are leaving out information about the environment, we are naturally in the setting of an open system um, where there is some uncertainty about which state it's in, not because we made a measurement, but rather because we are deliberately leaving out information about the rest of the universe, right? So this is exactly the scenario of a, of a pure state ensemble, or as we've seen, um, a system that has to be described in terms of a density matrix. So, so the question is, how do we go to this partial, reduced description if we actually start from the complete description, the complete description being of the entire universe? And the tool that we're going to need is known as a partial trace. Or trace with a subscript B, where the B denotes the bath or the environment. So, so consider that the following situation. Suppose we have a system and a bath, a system and an environment, right? And so think of it as this is the universe. And here is our system S. And everything outside of S is what we're calling B calling the environment. We want to focus just on S itself. Let's say that the state of the universe or the system and the bath is given by, for example, given by some density matrix rho of S alone, tensor it with rho of B alone. This is the simplest possible case you can imagine where the system and the bath are completely uncorrelated. They're in a tensor product. They're uncorrelated. Right. So how would I extract? What's the mathematical operation that would allow me to start from rho SB, from this whole thing, and get out just rho of S, rho of the system? Right. That's the partial trace. So we're going to define the partial trace of rho SB in this case. right? as just rho s times the trace of rho b. You see how the partial trace operating on a tensor product takes the trace only of the b part. And what is the trace of rho b? Well, because we're assuming that rho b is, is an actual density matrix, its trace is one because it's a density matrix, right? And so for this case, the simple case where 
we are starting from a tensor product completely uncorrelated. The partial trace gives us rho of s. So you see how the partial trace operation, which was defined as taking the trace of just the second component, gives us in this simple case just the, the state of the subsystem that we're interested in. Okay. So, so partial trace, more generally, we're going to define it as follows partial trace over B for any pair of operators A acting on S. Let's, 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 call, it, let's call it M acting on S. N acting on B. We're going to define that as do nothing to S multiplied by the trace of operator that's acting on B. This is how we define the partial trace. And we make it a linear operator. So in other words, if I take the partial trace of some linear combination, M S sub I, and B some I, maybe let's even put coefficients here. Let's make it even more general. B J times some coefficients C I J. Find that as these coefficients. Nothing happens to the S part, but we take the trace of the B part and B I. Okay, so, All right, so notice how I didn't put a subscript on, on the second trace. There's no need for the subscript on the second trace, because now this is just a normal trace. The partial trace is an operation from the space of operators on the tensor product Hilbert space down to the space of operators on just the system Hilbert space, okay? Because we're tracing out, that's, that's what we sometimes call it, we're tracing out the B part by doing the partial trace over, over B. We already saw that in this trivial case where system and bath are completely uncorrelated, performing this operation gives us the state of just the system alone. And, and so that's, that's good. Uh, that means we, our, our definition works as expected. When they are completely uncorrelated, when the system of bath are completely uncorrelated, the partial trace removes the bath from the description and gives us precisely just the state of the system. Now, what what, in a, what happens in a more general scenario? Right, so let's say let's kind of take the opposite extreme. What if I have a a maximally entangled state between S and B? between the system and the bath. Okay. So let's take simplest case. Let's say that the system is a qubit and the bath is, is also a qubit. So in other words, let's say that we have some pure state psi of S and B, which is a maximally ent entangled state of two qubits, zero on S, zero on B, plus one on S, one on B, normalized. And we make a density matrix out of it, right? So a pure state's density matrix, rho SB, which is just the outer product of this state with itself. And I, I'd now like to apply the partial trace operation to this state. Uh, Daniel, could you try yep. writing in could you try writing uh, in larger in larger size or a more bold pen? Uh, Yes, is there a problem with the uh, viewing the board or is the problem with the uh, sharing the, the whiteboard? Let's see. Uh, so we got a couple comments about that. I'm viewing the whiteboard and it might be a little, yeah, it might be a little hard to see on the whiteboard as well. Okay. Uh, let me, let me uh, use the, this font, and yeah, hopefully, but especially over Zoom. Yes, yes, okay. Um, okay, I'll I'll use the thicker font. Okay, so so we let's assume that we have a maximally entangled state uh, between our system and our bath. So what should we expect 
the description of our system in this case. Right? So if, if you have a maximally entangled state, then um, presumably you know from having studied uh, um, uh, Bell states and the EPR paradox and so on, you know that there is no information in this uh, about S or B for that matter uh, when they are in a, a maximally entangled state. All right, so if you if you were to perform a a measurement, let's say of sigma z on S in this kind of a state, then with equal probability you'd get zero or one equal probability half. So this, in other words, the state of the system S in this case is completely undetermined. It's completely random. In other words, it should be described by a maximally mixed state. While the joint state is maximally entangled, what we expect when we measure S is to get back a maximally mixed state. So if I remove B from the description, if I perform this partial trace, that's what I expect to get. I expect to get a maximally mixed state of S. And let's see if that's what happens. And do we get the maximally mixed state for S? Well, so partial trace over B of rho SB, really thick and kind of hard to, to write with. Uh, let me, I'm, I'm just gonna try to write on a larger font. Okay, and keep, keep complaining if, if, it's, if it's hard to see. And this is just a, a little too thick. Okay, so partial trace with respect to B of, of, of this density matrix. So what is that? Well, there's a factor of one half, and then we have zero, zero, and I'm dropping the subscripts, zero, zero, plus zero, zero with one, one, right, plus one, one with zero, zero, and then one, one with one, one. Okay, and if I take the partial trace, remember it's an instruction to take the trace only over the B part. So that would be zero, zero on the system times the trace of zero, zero on the bounce. Okay, plus one, one on the system times the trace of one, one on the bath. And then the two octagonal components, one of which is zero one on the system times the trace of zero one on the bath. And there's a fourth term with one and zero flipped, but you right away see that the trace of this term is zero, right? Because this trace, the trace of, of this is just the inner product of one with zero. So this is zero and same for the other off diagonal term. So what we're left with is just these two, these two terms. This trace is one and this trace is one as well. So indeed what we're left with is just one half of zero, zero plus one, one, which is the maximally mixed state. Right? The answer here at the end is that this, trace rho sb for the maximally mixed state is just the identity matrix over two. That's the maximally mixed state, which is what we expect. We expect that the state of our system when it's in a maximum entangled state with the bath is going to be maximally mixed. All right, so why am I telling you this? Because what it shows is that the, the partial trace as defined here, okay, is, is an operation that is plausible as far as giving us a reduced description of the system alone. And I, I've argued for it in, in, the, in terms of two examples, two extreme examples, uh, or two examples on opposite extremes. Um, and a more formal argument can be made, which is 
based on essentially a consistent picture of making measurements on the system versus making the same set of measurements when the system is coupled to a bath. Um, and you can read about that more careful argument in the lecture notes if you'd like. I don't have time to cover it here, um, but the conclusion is the same. The conclusion is that if you want a consistent picture of how to describe a subsystem or a reduced description um, of a, a subsystem coupled to the rest of the universe, the proper way to, to perform this averaging out, this tracing out operation of the bath is precisely the partial trace as, as defined here. Okay, so we're gonna, we're gonna accept this as a working definition of how to get the state of our subsystem. In other words, from now on, we're gonna think of the state of our system given that it's coupled to some bath as given by this description. It's an operational definition of how we get to the state of our, our system in, in this kind of scenario. Okay. Um, so with that in mind, let's just note one more technicality because uh, we're gonna need that. So I, I wrote, I wrote formally here what, what I meant by doing the partial trace, but um, let's say that the Hilbert space of the bath is spanned by some orthonormal basis, which I'm gonna call, let's say mu. I'm gonna use, from now on, I'm gonna use Greek letters for the bath and Latin letters for the system. So HS is going to be spanned by some other orthonormal set. Let's call that I. Let's put a subscript S and a subscript B here, three mind you. All right. So these are these are orthonormal states. Mu, let's say mu, Greek letters, that's delta mu nu. Likewise, I and J. Okay, the reason I'm introducing this is because I want to write the partial trace in, in a slightly different way, which is equivalent, but maybe more useful. So when I write something like partial trace of like over here, an operator on S tensored with another operator on B. So the partial trace, you can always think of it as the trace is the diagonal element in the bath basis, like this. Okay, so, so what, this, what this is saying is that the partial trace is the trace, so the sum over diagonal elements with respect to just the, the vectors in, in the bath basis. Right? And then if, if you, if you simplify this, then it becomes the sum over mu because these vectors act only on the bath. It's ms times mu and the mu, like so. Right? And of course, you can take the ms outside. Okay, so this, this is another way to think about the partial trace. It's just the sum of diagonal elements in the bath basis uh, of, of the bath operator. All right, so we're, we're gonna need that in, in a moment. Okay, so we've defined partial trace. It's a, a, a really crucial uh, technical tool that we're gonna use all the time in, uh, in our theory of, of open quantum systems. And now we're ready to ask a key question, which is given that we have the state of the universe, rho sb, and we know how that evolves, right? So we know that rho sb is, is the state of a closed system. It's the universe, it's a closed system. So rho sb as a function of time, that has to evolve because it's a closed system, because it's the whole universe, it has to evolve via a unitary that describes the whole universe. So here, this USB 
USB is the unitary generated by the Hamiltonian minus I H S B T. Okay, so this unitary is generated by the system bath Hamiltonian. Um, the Hamiltonian of, of the universe. Given that we know this, again, why do we know this? Why do we know that this is unitary? Because it's the, the universe. So that's the closest. Given that we also know that rho st, the, the state of the system alone at time t is given by the partial trace of rho s b of t. Now we want to find out what is this more explicitly. Okay, and and to in, in other words, we want to know what is the dynamical equation that describes the evolution of, of our open system. Rho s s is an open system. It's open because it's coupled to an environment. So what what is this explicitly? This expression. That's what we want to find out, right? And and that expression, whatever it is, is going to replace the unitary evolution that we know is true for a closed system. So that's our goal. Figure out precisely what describes the dynamics of an open system. Think of it as uh, an, a more sophisticated way of uh, postulate three. In postulate three, what we said before was essentially this. Um, which was equivalent to rho s b dot minus minus i commutator with rho s. What I what I didn't stress when I said this is postulate three, what I didn't stress was <clears throat> that I was still describing the closed system evolution of the density matrix. But now I'm interested in the genuine open system evolution of the density matrix. What happens after I trace out the state of the bath? Right? So we expect a correction to both of these, to the, the Liouville von Neumann equation or the unitary evolution equation for a density matrix. We expect a correction or a modification rather of this evolution law when we perform the partial trace operation, which is what we need to do in order to describe just the system, genuinely the open system. Okay, so let's let's work this out. So rho s t again, which is partial trace of rho s b at time t, which which we know is given by the unitary time t, the state of the system in the bath at time zero, USB dagger. I want to perform this partial trace. Well, actually, before I do that, I'm going to now introduce an important assumption. And the assumption is that there is a special time, we're going to call it time zero, at which actually the system and the bath are completely uncorrelated. All right, so this, this is an, a strong assumption. There is no really uh, good general justification for it, except to say that perhaps in an experiment, you can prepare initial conditions in which you have perfectly isolated your system somehow, um, and then you let it loose so it starts to interact with its environment. So you can think of this as a preparation. Um, and we, we set the, the clock such that at time zero, this is true, okay? Um, and uh, this assumption of a perfectly uncorrelated initial condition is something that 
we're going to have to revisit. Unfortunately, we won't have time to revisit it today, but hopefully it will be revisited in, uh, in future lectures uh, in, in this spring school that, that you're attending. Uh, but I, I just want you to be aware that this is, this is something that we're introducing here, slightly ad hoc. All right, but with this in mind, this assumption that at time zero, system and bath are perfectly uncorrelated, we can uh, talk about the spectral decomposition of the state of the, the valve. So let me write the spectral decomposition eigenvalues, let's say lambda nu, eigenvectors nu. Okay, so I'm over here. So this is, these are the eigenvalues. They're all non negative. And these are the eigenvectors. Um, so this is just the spectral decomposition of a density matrix in terms of non-negative eigenvalues and a complete set of orthonormal uh, eigenvectors. And now I'm going to write the partial trace. So rho s of t. I'm going to use this way of writing it in terms of a complete orthonormal basis of the bath. And I'm going to pick the same basis that diagonalizes the bath density matrix. I'm going to write this as a sum over mu, mu, bath. So think of these again as the eigenvectors of the bath, of the bath density matrix. These mu's are the eigenvectors of rho b at time zero. And uh, inside, I need to plug in U S B T rho S at time zero, answered with here is rho B at time zero, and then U. Bath. Okay, so all this is the bath density matrix at time zero times USB dagger times T mu again. So this is the state of our system at time T. Okay, let's write it as a double sum over mu and mu. Bath eigenvector number mu. U S B of T. Now let's take this ket, and because it acts on the bath, it's a, or it, it, sorry, it, it's a vector in the bath Hilbert space. It commutes with the density matrix of the system. They operate in different Hilbert spaces, so I can move it over past rho s, and I can place it all the way here, and then comes rho system. Okay, and then I have the mu bath mu dagger mu bath. Now let's not forget these eigenvalues. I'm going to put square root of lambda nu here, and another one over here, lambda nu square root. Okay, so <laughs> this was a little bit of algebra. And at this point, I want you to focus on this entire expression here. I'm going to call it k mu nu t. And if you look carefully over here, this is precisely the Hermitian conjugate of that k mu nu. See the Position of the mu and the new indices got flipped relative to here, u dagger versus u. And the lambda, here is where it's important that lambda is positive. Right? The lambda is a positive, so when I take the square root, it remains a positive number. Nothing happens under the uh, emission conjugation operation. So, all in all, we 
got the following result. The state of the system at time t can be written in a very simple form. I'm actually going to introduce a single index alpha here. K alpha of t rho s zero. K alpha dagger of t, where alpha is this double index u and u, and k alpha of t is given by the square root of lambda nu. This is the square root of the nu uh, eigenvalue of the Bath density matrix. And then this so-called partial matrix element, like partial trace, partial matrix element. Notice that this is, this is a real, uh, this, this is not a real matrix element. It's not a complete matrix element in the sense that what's left here after you take this matrix element is an operator, not a scalar. Why? Because U sub SB is an operator on the system bath Hilbert space. Right? This acts on the system bath Hilbert space. This matrix element is only with respect to the bath. So it's like, uh, what I said over here, right, with the partial trace, the partial trace is an operation that acts on, that takes operators acting on the joint system bath Hilbert space, takes them to operators acting just on the system Hilbert space. Same thing is happening here. Um, this partial matrix element takes an operator acting on the system in the bath, reduces it to an operator acting just on the system by removing the, the bath. Okay, so, so this result, is absolutely pivotal for the theory of open quantum systems. This is known as the Krauss operator sum representation. Are also sometimes known as simply OSR, operator sum representation. Okay, so we're going to have a lot to say about this. I want to make a few comments right off the bat. What this tells you is that instead of the closed system scenario, remember in the closed system, we had rho of t is a unitary acting on rho zero from the left and right. right? This is for closed system or for, sorry, this is before partial trace. Right, so th this described um, the system in the back jointly. This is equivalent to um, the Liouville von Neumann expression, right? So this is equivalent to rho dot is minus pi. What we found is that if we're focused just on the system after partial trace, we get a new dynamical equation. Right? And, and it's more general. You see, there is, there's not just a single term, a unitary acting from the left and the right. We have some more complicated objects, these cross operators. That's what they're called. Uh, the K alphas are called cross operators. Uh, acting from the left and the right. And also we have to sum over them. Okay. 
Uh, so it's observation number one, the situation for an open system, the reduced description of the dynamics is more complicated than uh, if we look at the, the joint evolution of the system in the back. Observation number two, there is actually something that these cross operators uh, have to satisfy because we want the trace of rho s to always be one, right? It's supposed to remain a valid density matrix. This always has to be one. And if I take the trace, take the trace inside, all right, so k alpha rho s zero, k alpha dagger, I can simplify that by moving the sum inside after moving k alpha dagger all the way to the left here. All right, so I can write this as the, let's write it, sorry, let's write it as sum inside. So the trace of sum over alpha, k alpha dagger, k alpha, like this, row s zero. I just move the k alpha dagger over to the left, move the sum inside. And in order for this, this is a demand, uh, this has to be equal one, right? This has to be one. So this then should be the identity matrix. If this is the identity matrix, then what I get is trace of rho s to time zero, which we're assuming that we're starting from a properly normalized initial state. This is one, right? So then it's fine. So these cross operators have to satisfy this constraint, okay? Which is like a generalization of the constraint that a unitary has to satisfy. In the case of a unitary, if, if K alpha were a unitary, and if there was only one of them, like here, then automatically U dagger U would be identity. But here something more general has to happen because we have these cross operators. The sum of K alpha dagger K alpha has to equal the identity. Okay, so that's that's another observation. We we have this constraint. Okay, and we also know that this reduces to let's call this equation star reduces to star when we have only one. Cross operator. Right. When we have only one cross operator, of course, this this equation just becomes k rho k dagger, which is like this one. And because of the constraint, we know that that k has to be unitary. So <clears throat> the previous case, think of it as the, the Schrödinger equation or the Liouville von Neumann equation, is a special case of what's what what we saw here. For an open system, All right? So Schrodinger or Liouville von Neumann is a special case of the Krauss. Operator sum of representation. So we've we've genuinely generalized our description of the dynamics of an open system. We found a more general dynamical equation, which, in a special case of a single Krauss operator, reduces back to the the Schrodinger or the Liouville von Neumann case. Right, so we we've genuinely generalized the description. Um, when do we actually specifically get back the case of a single unitary? Right, so, so it's easy to see that if the unitary of the system and the bath together, the joint unitary is a tensor product, If this is true, I'm going to let you check. It's a, it's a quick exercise. Then, K 
get rho s of t is u s of t rho s of zero u s dagger t. Okay, so in this special case, when the joint unitary decomposes into a tensor product, then we get back the original unitary description. But in general, that doesn't have to be the case at all. In general, there's, there's no reason for the unitary to decompose into a simple tensor product. In fact, this is basically equivalent to, let me write it down here. Okay, this is equivalent to the total system bath Hamiltonian having a very simple structure, a system Hamiltonian and a bath Hamilton. But in general, there will be a coupling term. Okay. In general, there will be plus an interaction term, H interaction, where this interaction is something that couples the, the system and the bath together. And it's exactly that interaction which does the interesting work, right? It's the, 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 uh, the part of the Hamiltonian that gives rise to some kind of non-trivial correlations between the system and the bath when there is an interaction term between them. So, so this scenario where the system bath unitary decomposes into a, a simple tensor product is, is extremely special, non-generic. Um, and all the, you know, the fun stuff that happens in open quantum systems arises from the fact that this actually is not true in general. And that's because there is an interaction term, a non-trivial interaction. Okay, so let's see what else we can say here in quite generally about the result that we got. Basically the result we got is we have what's called a quantum map. You could think of the state of the system at time t as being the result of some map I'm going to call it capital Phi, applied to the state of the system at time zero. And the explicit form of this map this. And we know the explicit form of these cross operators we, we derived. But it's going to pay to think of this as um, as something a bit more abstract. Let's let's forget for for a moment that we actually know the explicit form of the cross operators. Um, let's just think of them as as just abstract operators satisfying the constraint k alpha dagger k alpha is the identity operator. Right? And now we can ask ourselves, what are the properties of of this map phi? By the way, this is also often called a superoperator. Phi is a superoperator. Why is it called a superoperator? Well, because it's an operator on operators. Right? It maps the operator rho s at time zero to a new operator rho s at time t. So it's a superoperator. Think of it as phi is a mapping from operators acting on HS to operators acting on HS. So phi itself belongs to some new space, right? Which is the B of the B of HS. And as soon as you see that, you, you see that you can keep generalizing this, right? We can have super operators of super operators and so on. And that's, that's an interesting exercise to play, but we won't do it today. Um, so what are the kind of defining properties of, of the super operator phi or this quantum map phi? Well, um, I want to think of it as 
uh, a general map, then its defining properties are, first of all, it's linear. That's very easy to check. So for example, well, specifically, phi of, let's say, A times some operator, let me call it X, plus B, some operator Y. You can easily check by plugging it in here. You can easily show that that is A of phi X, B of phi Y. Uh, for all uh, X and Y in B of HS. So it's linear. That's number one. Number two, I claim that it's trace preserving. And we already saw that. That came, that is why we had to impose this, this constraint here. All right, so the trace of phi of any operator x is the trace of this expression, k alpha x, k alpha dagger. And by the exact same manipulation that I did over there, you can move the trace inside, uh, move the k alpha dagger to the left, then move the trace outside again. This is the trace of x which in the density matrix case, we said is one, but it doesn't, in general, it doesn't have to be one. So that's what we mean by trace preserve. All right, so the, the state uh, we get after the map, which is phi of X is the same, that has the same trace as that before the map. So it's linear, it's trace preserving. And one more thing, it's also positivity preserving. By this, what we mean is that if an operator X is a positive operator, then phi of X is also a positive operator. And, and why is that true? Well, if I take some vector V and apply that to Phi of x, like so. All right, so this is sum of alpha, v k alpha, x k alpha dagger v. Sorry, I, I realize my handwriting is becoming small again. And if you call this w alpha, then this is W alpha ket. So in other words, the whole thing is just sum over alpha W alpha X W alpha, but X we assumed is a positive operator because it's a positive operator. All of these diagonal elements are, are positive. So then phi of X is also positive for, for any V. All right, so in other words, phi maps positive operators X to new positive operators phi of X. So, so this map that we define here is linear trace preserving and positive. Positive now is shorthand for positivity preserving. When we say a, a super operator or a map is positive, really what we mean is it preserves the positivity of the operators that it acts on. Okay. So now we can ask uh, an important question. Is this necessary and sufficient in order to get the Krauss representation, the Krauss operator sum representation? So what we've shown is that if a map is in the form of the Krauss operator sum representation, then it satisfies all three of these properties. But is it also true that if we have a map that is linear trace preserving and positivity preserving, then that map must be in the form of a Krauss operator sum representation. And the answer to that, perhaps surprisingly, is, is no. 
It turns out, let me number these, all this one, two, and three. It turns out that if you want for a map to give you the Krauss form, the operator sum of presentation form, then three has to be modified to something known as complete positivity. Complete, well, positivity preserving, complete positivity. Has to replace three such that a Krauss operator summer presentation. All right, so the claim is one, two, and three prime for some map for some map or super operator phi is equivalent to Krauss operator summer presentation. Okay, and positivity alone is 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 not enough. We need this thing called complete positivity. And what is complete positivity? Well, it's um it's the following. Uh, imagine that we we you know we have a system in a bath right now. Imagine that we introduce yet a third system. We're going to call it R for reservoir or whatever. Um, and we're going to introduce it in such a way that it really does absolutely nothing. So uh, what I mean by that is that if we take our map phi, the only thing we're going to do with R is we're going to tensor phi with the identity operation on R, on this third system. Okay, so this is the identity super operator. That's why I'm gonna use this fancy I notation here. So this map phi, it acts on the system S. Right? We already traced out the bath. So, so phi um, has memory of the bath, so to speak. The bath is in there, but it's, it's a super operator on just on, on, on the system. Now we're introducing a third object, a third Hilbert space, HR, and we're considering the identity superoperator on R. And we're gonna ask that for any operator A, where here A belongs to the operators on the system times this, extra reservoir R, and moreover, A is positive. Okay, so for all such operators, we're gonna ask that this is positive. No matter what the dimension D of this reservoir is, okay, for all D and operators A. This is called complete positivity. So what it's saying is that if you introduce another system, R, no matter what its dimension is, as long as you do nothing to it, right? So you just tensor your original map with the identity operation, the result should remain a positive operator if you started with a positive operator, A. That's complete positivity. And of course, when D is one, right? Um, <clears throat> when um, the, 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 the reservoir is trivial, it's, it does nothing actually. D is one means that all you have there are scalars in that Hilbert space. So it's like multiplying by, uh, by a scalar in that case. Well, so when D is one, this reduces to uh, ordinary positivity, standard. Positivity. But when D is, is greater than one, then this, this is some kind of a non trivial additional requirement, which, however, seems to make a lot of sense. It's, uh, it's uh, like, uh, um, like we're doing nothing uh, to this, this reservoir. And, it, and I say like because actually this turns out to be important. 
Um, and it's easy to check that the uh, OSR, the Krauss map, actually satisfies this complete positivity requirement. All right, so if, if we actually check what is phi with tensored with identity on some operator A where phi is our OSR, well, then it means apply the identity operator, see, not, not curly, standard identity to this operator A, K alpha dagger times identity dagger, which of course is just identity again. And I'm assuming that A is positive and I wanna check whether this is positive. So if, if I, again, do this, the same thing, I apply some vector V from the left and the right, take the matrix element, right? And I do that here, V, All this A and then K alpha dagger identity B. Call this like before, call this W alpha. And this is W alpha as a cat. And then this is just W alpha A, W alpha. And because we assume that A is positive, then this is positive. So you see that for the specific form of a crowd operator summer presentation, this is indeed not just positive, it's completely positive. Our, our crowd operator summer presentation is, is a completely positive map because it didn't matter what, what the dimension of, of this identity here was, right? For any, any dimension, this calculation holds. Um, so the operator summer presentation is a completely positive map. And it turns out that this, this complete positivity is um, surprisingly important, uh, even though it, from the way I described it to you, it may seem like it's some, some kind of a uh, fairly useless abstract notion, but it isn't. Uh, we can use it to construct uh, entanglement tests, for example. So uh, this is not something we're gonna have time to talk about, but if you're familiar with um, uh, the partial transpose criterion, for example, for uh, whether a state is entanglement or not. Uh, that derives from this notion of complete positivity. Uh, and it's also a way to um, look at a, uh, a proposed quantum map and, or a proposed map and decide whether it is a valid uh, quantum map or not. Because if it's not completely positive, this map that somebody tells you, uh, here, I have a map. Tell me, is this a valid quantum map? Well, not so if it's not completely positive. And so there's a test, it's called the, the Choi test, or it involves the so-called Choi matrix, which you can uh, write down, which is a somewhat less abstract way to test this complete positivity than, than what I did here. Is you have to construct a certain matrix and calculate its eigenvalues, see whether they're positive or not. That's the Choi matrix. It's used in quantum process tomography. Um, so this is a very, it, it, it's, it's a constraining type of, of condition, complete positivity, which we can use to test for entanglement, uh, test whether a proposed dynamical evolution law is legitimate or not for, uh, for quantum mechanics. The one thing I have, to, I have to stress again is that the reason that we got this complete positivity result, it's kind of buried in here, but um, we made this assumption in the very beginning of the derivation about the tensor product. Right, that the, the state of the system in the bath at time zero were completely uncorrelated. And if this assumption fails to hold, and there are arguments you can um, promote against it, then this story becomes much trickier uh, and even breaks down. Um, and there's, there's a lot of um, debate in the literature and it's still in a kind of a active current field what is it that uh, we can do to replace this severe assumption, make it less restrictive and still get meaningful quantum dynamics? Right? And so uh, I'll leave it at that. It's, it's an active area of research. So now we have constructed a theory um, that 
allows us to describe the dynamics of, of an open quantum system, the reduced dynamics of an open quantum system. And the next thing I want to do with it is uh, try it out on, on a qubit. All right, so the next thing I want to talk about is quantum maps of, uh, of a qubit. So when I say quantum map, what I mean are these Krauss operator summer presentation type super operators. All right, so quantum map is the same as phi of some operator x is this, such that these cross operators are uh, obey this constraint. All right, and, and sometimes people call this channel, and sometimes it's just called a CP map. CP stands for completely positive. Um, so what, uh, what happens to the state of a qubit when it is subject to, uh, to this kind of uh, a transformation? Okay, uh, so this is why we worked out the, the geometric picture of uh, how a qubit appears um, in terms of the Bloch sphere. Now we can use that same formalism to try to visualize what happens uh, when a qubit is subjected to, to a quantum map or channel or, or a CP map. Okay, and, and we're gonna we're gonna forget about the, the origin of the cross operators, uh, at least temporarily. And so we, we, we know what the cross operators are. We, we know that they arise from this fairly complicated expression, right, with the partial matrix element that I wrote down before. But we're going to forget about this. And, and instead, we're just going to um, postulate, or well, not postulate, we're going to just um, introduce cross operators uh, as we please in order to describe uh, different types of, of processes. So, uh, for example, one type of process is called a, um, a unital map. Okay, so, a unital map is a map that phi that takes the identity to itself. Okay, that's unital by definition. So what can we say about, about unital maps? Well, um, and, and this, this is more general. This is not just about Cupid. Maybe I'll, I'll delete that for a moment. We'll get back to the Cupid case. So for a unital map, because it maps the identity to itself by definition, what we know is that you know, phi of identity is K alpha identity K alpha dagger, but now there's identity there. So this is just K alpha K alpha dagger, which is mapped to the identity by definition of a unital map, right? So, so unital map satisfy a second constraint. This is the normalization constraint or the trace preservation constraint. Unital maps have this additional problem. What's an example of a unital map? Well, any mixture, probabilistic mixture of unitaries So if I told you that my, my map phi is like this, with probability pi apply unitary number i to x. Okay, so you can see right away what the cross operators are here, right? The cross operators are just the square root of pi times ui. All right, so a map that has this kind of a structure, 
with probability pi apply unitary i, this is clearly a unital map because if you replace x by identity, then ui cancels with ui dagger. You're left with the sum of the pi's, which is one because it's a probability distribution. Okay, so <laughs> this is a, an important class of, of channels. So we'll talk about it in a moment. Um, so let's let's take some examples now of, uh, of the case of, of a qubit. And we'll start with, with a unital map. So consider what's called the dephasing map. And the dephasing map is where we say, now I'm gonna write rho because we're interested in transformations of states again. And I'm, I'm gonna drop the subscript S because from now on, we're just talking about what happens to our system. So let's say that with probability P, I apply the identity to rho. And with probability one minus P, I apply the poly sigma Z matrix. So that's called dephasing uh, because of the, the Z there. Okay, so, so clearly this is an example of a probabilistic mixture of unitaries, right? There are just two unitaries here, the trivial identity and, and the poly sigma Z. Um, and I, I'm interested in, in what happens to the state of a cube under this transformation. So I can erase the identity here, right? Let's just write it as p times rho. Okay, so let's make use of the Bloch vector to understand what, what this looks like. So we know that, uh, let's call it rho prime, is the state that rho gets mapped into. On the one hand, we know that because it's a density matrix, rho prime, we, we can always write it as one half identity plus Bloch vector components. And I'll put a prime there. All right, so the, the, the vector V prime is the vector with components Vx, Vx prime, Vy prime, Z prime. Uh, it, it's equivalent to the new density matrix rho prime, which we get as the result of this map. On the other hand, we know that phi of rho is, is given in this way. So it's, it's P times rho, the initial density matrix, identity plus the I. I right, plus one minus P Z times the same thing. One half identity plus sum of the I sigma I. All this times Z like so. I want to understand how the vector V prom how the vector V which is equivalent to the initial density matrix, how it's mapped to the new vector V prime. Okay, so let's simplify this a little bit. There's um, P, there's, let's, let's factor out the halves everywhere. Right, so there's, there's a half here, there's another half here. Uh, so there's P times identity, and then one minus P, Z, I, Z, which is identity again. So P times identity plus one minus P times identity. So that's one half identity. And then there's um, P times <clears throat> B, I, sigma, I from here. <clears throat> and then there is one minus P. Now, uh, let's write it explicitly. So there's sigma x, 
conjugated by z from both sides. Vx, zx, z, vy, z, y, z, and finally vz, z, 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 like so. And it's easy to check from the properties of poly matrices that, that this is minus x and this is minus y. And of course, this is just z itself, because z squared is identity times z. Okay, so the whole thing is one half identity plus uh, there's a, a vx which gets multiplied by there's a, a, uh, a p and uh, minus one plus p. So it's two p minus one times x. And likewise, a vy, same thing, two p minus one times y. And vz on the other hand, well, nothing happened. So it's just z, right? the, the p's cancel. And all this is equal to one half identity plus the prime sigma. I. Right, so you can read off what, what happened here. You can see that vx prime is two p minus one times vx. And the same is true for y. But vz is just vz prime is just vz. So, so this dephasing map has the effect of modifying the, the x and the y component, but not modifying the z component. And so if, if you think of the transformation of the, the block vector, block vector v, the new block vector, has been multiplied by a diagonal matrix The uh, old block vector is multiplied by a diagonal matrix to give us the, the new block vector. And in terms of the, the block sphere, if we started from a sphere, what the effect of the map was, this dephasing map, these are the vx, vy, vz axes. All right, so what happened here was that the block vector, the block sphere has shrunk in the xy plane. P is the probability of z being applied. So uh, 2p minus one is, is a number between one and negative one. So in general, what happened is that the block sphere became kind of a football, a vertical football or an ellipsoid. Right, it shrunk, this was the original sphere, it shrunk, it shrunk in the xy plane, the vx, vy plane, to be precise. Right, and there, there are points that didn't move at all. The, the points that don't move at all are the points on the z-axis. It's easy to see that, well, because vz prime is vz, any point on the uh, that was purely on the x on the z axis is unaffected. So, in particular, the north pole and the south pole, which was the zero and the one states, those are unaffected. But uh, any other state on the z axis is, is unaffected. Every other state off the z axis is pushed in closer to the um, the vertical z axis. Uh, and, and by how much? Well, the new radius. Right, the new radius of this ellipsoid along this direction is precisely 2p minus one. That's the new radius. So, so the effect of um, a, a dephasing map like this is to shrink the block sphere 
into an ellipsoid or a vertical football um, <clears throat> shrunk in the xy plane. And likewise, if we think about a different map, uh, let's call it the bit flip map. The bit flip map where we simply change z into x, so right? Now, if I replace phi rho by, with probability p do nothing, but with probability one minus p apply x, sigma x to rho. All right, so then by symmetry, I don't have to recalculate anything. By symmetry, um, what's gonna happen is quite obvious. All right, so the new law vector now, here we applied z and the z component was unaffected. So if I apply x, the x component will be unaffected. Right, like so. And that means that the, the new block sphere will again be an ellipsoid, but this time it's going to be aligned in the x along the xy, sorry, along the x-axis. Right, so it's going to shrink in the uh, yz plane. Um, so think of it as a rotation of, uh, of what happened with, uh, with the dephasing map. And so the bit flip map in that sense is, is nothing new. And of course you can combine the two, you can do a phase bit flip map with, with sigma y, and then the ellipsoid will be aligned along the y axis. So these are examples of, of unital maps. Um, <clears throat> let's give another example which is, is not a unital map. So let's talk about what's called sometimes amplitude damping or spontaneous emission. So, so here we, we have a a clear physical picture in mind. Suppose we have a, a two-level atom with a ground state and an excited state. And, and suppose that because of the presence of the environment, which could be, let's say, some external electromagnetic fields that it's, it's coupled to, let's say the atom is in a cavity, and it's coupled to the modes of, of the cavity, um, the atom can make a, a down transition you know, while emitting a photon. So let's describe this in, in the language of our, our quantum maps. How would we describe this? Well, we can introduce a Krauss operator, I'm gonna call it K1, which describes that with probability P, this down transition happens. So because of, the way a cross operators appear, that would be square root of p. And we're going to go from the one state to the zero state. That would be one of the cross operators. Okay, so this cross operator describes a transition from the excited state one to the ground state zero with probability p. Let's say that once the atom is in the ground state, I'm going to introduce a second cross operator. Have to, otherwise uh, it would have to be unitary. So if the atom is already in the ground state, it's going to stay there. Okay, so so zero goes to zero for sure. Zero goes to zero. Um, so that seems to be an appropriate description of a two-level system coupled to an extremely cold, maybe even zero temperature environment. Why do I, you know, I, I'm invoking temperature all of a sudden. Um, you know, there's some physics behind this, of course, uh, given in terms of the Hamiltonian and you know, the, the state of the environment and, and all that, which we're not getting into, where we're doing phenomenology, phenomenology here. But uh, if I had a zero temperature environment, what that means is that 
the system, our atom can emit into the environment, uh, but the environment never gives, right? So if the system is in the ground state, it's gonna stay there because the environment is at zero temperature, it doesn't have any energy to give. So this seems like a good description of two cross operators, which would describe spontaneous emission in the presence of a zero temperature bath. Uh, but if you're careful and you, you try to now enforce this rule, that this has to be identity, what you'll find is that it doesn't work. Okay, so these, these two cross operators, they don't actually satisfy this constraint. And it turns out you have to modify this cross operator in order for the rule to work. And I'm gonna let you check that uh, if you'd like. And you have to modify it as follows. You have to add this to it. Okay, and now you can check that um, the normalization constraint, this constraint is, is satisfied. And so the, the meaning of this term is that basically in the zero temperature environment, if, if the system is in the, in the excited state, um, it's gonna stay in the excited state with some probability less than one. Uh, and, and that's because it wants to emit, okay? So, so these are the, uh, the two cross operators for this case. So you can, you can check that uh, they're properly normalized. All right, so let's work out what, um, what, what the transformation of the, uh, the block vector is in this case. So let's get a geometrical picture, just like we saw this ellipsoid. Uh, let's see what happens in this case. And uh, this is not a unital map, by the way, right? So you, you can see that uh, if you now apply phi to the identity operator with these two cross operators, right? So sum over k alpha, identity, k alpha dagger, you will find that this does not equal the identity operator. So this is not a unital map. Okay, so what, what does happen? Well, um, let's again look at V prime, which is one half, as we said before, sorry, rho prime, which is one half identity, plus sigma i is the Krauss map applied to rho, in other words, to one half identity plus I, the i sigma i. Okay, so, um, Let's see, how much time do we have? I think I'm gonna, I'm gonna skip this calculation. I'm gonna uh, let you check it. And, and here's what you're gonna find. You're gonna find, it's, it's a very straightforward calculation, as essentially the same as, as what I did over there. What you'll find is that V prime now is given by following matrix acting on V. Uh, so square root of one minus P, square root of one minus P, one minus P, plus, turns out there is a shift vector, zero, zero, one minus P. Okay, so in this non-unital case, which um, we, we have a shift vector, and that is actually a general statement about non-unital maps. Whenever the map is unital, there's no shift, there's no affine component to the transformation. Whenever the map is non-unital, there is always a, a shift vector. It becomes an affine transformation uh, of the Bloch vector. So pictorially, what this looks like is now the Bloch sphere moves, its center is at this point one minus P along the Z axis. And, and you see it's, it's, more, uh, it's more compressed in, along the z direction than along the x and y direction. So it looks like a, uh, an ellipsoid 
that has been compressed along the um, along the, the z-axis, and it's wider in the in the xy plane. Right? If if this was the original box sphere, this is what happened to it. It's moved up to this point one minus p, and it's compressed um, along the z direction. And in the limit that uh, that p is one, right? In the limit when uh, there is always going to be an emission event, then when p is one, um, right? Is there something wrong here? Let's see. Um, I, I may have flipped what is P of one minus P, one sec. Ah, yes. Of course, this, this, this is P, sorry. This is P, not one minus. Okay. Uh, so in the limit when P is one, when there is always the the emission event, um, then everything is concentrated uh, at the north pole, right? So the shift vector is zero zero one, um, and um, uh, this matrix is zero, right? So everything goes to the north pole. Everything shrinks down to a point. Which makes sense because the North Pole is the zero state, right? And the zero state is where everything goes to when, with probability one, you have you have a mission. Right? So everything goes to the ground state in that limit. When p is less than one, then there's some there are some states that survive that are not the ground state, uh, which are described precisely by this compressed uh, ball sphere. Okay, Richard, how are we doing with with time? Because there's there's one more chapter here that I was planning to cover, but um, I don't have. I, yeah, I think we are about fifty minutes over the original time, and we lost half an hour, so we're roughly ten minutes over. And so we, I think we should start the Q and A at one thirty, regardless. Okay. okay. Uh, so the chapter that that we skipped uh, is an important chapter. It's the chapter on master equations and the Lindblad equation. Um, so I encourage you to read about it in the lecture notes. Uh, it's there. Um, everything I was going to say is is covered in the lecture notes, and I'm happy to uh, address it in the Q and A. Um, so if, assuming people have time to to read it and absorb it, uh, happy to uh, answer any questions that might arise. Yeah. All right. So I I think I'm going to stop here then, and you know thank you for for your attention. Uh, Everybody can take a break and go work on the, the problem sets and um, resume at the Q&A. Okay. And so thank you, everybody. Thank you, Daniel. That was, that was a fantastic set of lectures this morning. Um, so we just posted in the chat the link to the next Zoom room where everyone will then be sent out to breakout rooms to work together in groups of up to six. Um, and then at 1.30, we will all rejoin in that Zoom room, the new Zoom room, not the webinar, for Q&A at 1.30.